This is best friend of the show, Monica Cabina, artist and colorist on Batman The Adventures Continue. And you're listening to the DCAU Review, hosted by Cal and Lee, streaming at DCAUReview.com and on your favorite podcast app. Hey everybody, welcome to the DCAU Review bonus episode number 18. I am one of your hosts, and with me, my good friend, good brother, the gentleman that runs our Twitter account. That's right, it's Liam. Liam, welcome to bonus episode 18. That's right, and uh, this week we are talking about Batman The Adventures Continue number one, which I could have sworn we've already done that, Cal. Wasn't that, wasn't that a bonus episode we already did? Deja vu, I, I feel like maybe even very, like almost a year ago this yeah, this yeah. month <laughs> yeah just the feeling i got but no uh joking aside this is of course the beginning of season two of batman the adventures continue so we have a new number one and uh, a brand new storyline introducing a bunch of characters some classic dc characters that we've seen in this universe before and uh, one pretty big one that's a more recent addition to the comics that has never appeared in this animated form before. So uh, quite a bit of exciting things to talk about with this first issue of Batman The Adventures Continue, a season two. That's right, Liam. And uh, if you have not gone back and listened to our reviews, we did full in-depth reviews. Uh, and if you recall, Liam, these issues were originally, uh, at least season one's issues were originally released on digital. And then, uh, so the actual full issues were split into two parts uh, digitally, and then they were released in physical form later on. Uh, as so basically we have multiple episodes where we're covering what amounts to multiple parts, but they all make up, uh, the, the, what was it? Seven, eight issues that ended up coming out, uh, for, for the entire series. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, eight. Yeah. A, a nice round number of eight. Love that. Uh, even number. Uh, so uh, since then, uh, it, they announced initially that it seemed like it was going to follow the same sort of format. There was going to be digital and then uh, later on a physical copy released. And then maybe two, three weeks ago, something happened and the digital release date got pushed back to the same date as the physical release date. Uh, so we kind of we're left scratching our heads about what was going on with that. Not sure what was happening. We were, uh, you and I actually mourned possibly the loss of uh, one of our favorite features of the digital comics, that being the title cards, uh, which uh, had accompanied each of the digital releases. And then uh, actually in the physical graphic novel uh, collected version of season one, they uh, actually did include those those, uh, mm -hmm. those homages to the original Batman the Animated Series title cards. Uh, definitely go out and pick that up, by the way. Uh, your local comic book store, preferably support those guys, or uh, you can find it, of course, out there uh, wherever you like, uh, wherever you buy your books and graphic novels. Anyway, uh, Liam, so we then learned that actually everything was happening the same day. There was some a little bit of mix up. It was like originally sort of half released on digital, but the physical copy was released on the same day, but then they updated it. So all's well that ends well. We ended up getting a single full issue uh, that makes up this issue number one. No cliffhanger, but we did get a, uh, a nice homage to those title cards uh on this one so we'll, we'll kick it off there it features uh uh a very familiar if you're if you followed batman and standard dc continuity for maybe the last i don't know 10 within the last 10 years you would probably mm -hmm. recognize that fella but uh, again as you said someone who's not been featured uh in uh in the dcau yeah so we are, of course, talking about the introduction of the Court of Owls. And in this case, in the title card, the uh, the sort of right hand, the fist of the Court of Owls, which is this Talon character. Um, I believe in the in the comics, there are multiple Talons. But so far here, we've only seen the one. But uh, regardless, it's uh, uh, it, yeah, it was introduced at the it, starting in the very first issue of Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo's uh, Batman run in the 
very beginning of the new 52 uh, era of DC comics. So yeah, we're looking at about just, just about exactly 10 years since that, that initial storyline took off and uh, they've already made it into other areas and other mediums, including uh, an animated, animated straight to DVD movie um, as well as the Gotham TV series. So they've had, it's hard to say, or it's hard to argue that of recent created comic book characters, uh, the court of owls has caught on in a way and has been featured in a way that very few others have uh, in, in, at least that quickly. So they're definitely sort of one of the, the hotter properties of the last 10 years or so of DC comics and uh, pretty exciting to see them brought into this animated world. We of course knew it was a possibility at least at one point because uh, in the, I guess now officially seemingly canceled Batman, the adventures continue action figure line there was of course an animated style talon figure so uh we kind of figured maybe there was a chance that 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 character could show up but uh of course at the time we didn't know we were getting this season too so definitely cool to see them in there and to see them in this style yeah agreed absolutely as you said that that whole storyline uh is is certainly one of uh, arguably a, a huge fan favorite over the last decade and uh certainly memorable enough and uh you know we've seen it before uh if you recall i think batman the animated series it was probably three or four years after nightfall they decided to introduce bane into the dcau uh bane, bane was like the hottest most interesting thing of 1992 when batman the animated series originally debuted mm-hmm. uh, but they waited a couple of years to bring him in so it's not it's uh it's sort of on brand for the dcau and certainly the writers of batman the animated series to adapt some of those more popular storylines and characters and we even saw it obviously in season one uh where we were introduced to jay Jason Todd and the Red Hood and uh, some of those additional characters that had not been brought in to the DCA originally. So that's some of the fun of this comic. Again, if you haven't read any of season one yet, highly uh, advise you going out, picking up uh, either uh, back issues of that, if you can find them at your local comic book store or pick up the uh, collected graphic novel, uh, well worth the read. So Liam, we'll get into uh, the plot for this now that we kind of have the background a little bit here. We, uh, we kick things off here and, uh, uh, there's there's a little bit of uh, some familiar faces that are reintroduced here. Yeah, we start off with uh, one Mayor Hill and uh, him at his 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 estate with his wife and uh, seems things he seems a bit distracted, a bit uh, out of sorts. And uh, then we we see him realize that there is someone in the room with him and uh, and and he is. Uh, off screen or off page in this case he is he is in fact murdered uh and yeah that's that's how we open our book with a long established uh batman the animated series character i think i think he's in on leather wings i think he goes all the way back to the very first episode of the series for sure so i mean this is i mean obviously he wasn't a a hugely important character but was a definitely a recurring character that appeared quite a bit so that's a pretty like jarring and shocking way to start your story is to bring in a new villain and immediately have them uh, assassinate the the mayor of Gotham city. Uh, For sure. Yeah. I'd say that's, that's one way to kick things off. And it's, as you mentioned, his role had been somewhat diminished in the, uh, the new Batman adventures. So it wasn't as if we had had, uh, much of a of a uh, increased role and, and had certainly decreased and they had seemingly aged him up a little bit his hair was uh, was now fully white instead of being gray before so uh, not surprising that he wasn't going to make it uh, to to Batman beyond but maybe we now know why they decided to memorialize him uh, naming Terry's uh, high school after him and Batman beyond. Uh, such a tragic way for for the uh, longest termed mayor of Gotham uh, to pass away. Uh, so, as you mentioned, there is a bit of a min- mystery occurring there. Uh, but in the background, uh, there's also uh, before we find out that the mayor has indeed been murdered, uh, they switch points of view to another familiar character. If you have uh, watched Justice League Unlimited or maybe read some of the other Batman comic book tie-ins and 
that is uh, one of the stars of our month of magic, Liam, that being one Boston brand, a.k.a. the dead man. Yeah, they uh, that's uh, that was a pretty cool inclusion to see that uh, see him brought in. We see him sort of floating through the through the skies of Gotham City um, and uh, we'll, we'll get into artwork a little bit, but some some really good stuff there. He floats in. Wouldn't you know it? The circus is in town and uh, he happens to hover over uh, Dick Grayson. That's right. Nightwing is in the book this time, folks. Heck yeah uh page, like page three like we didn't we didn't dilly dally he's right he's in it he's going to be an important part of at least this initial court of owls story it seems so uh yeah he he shows up we see him and and barbara gordon appearing to be on a date uh at, at the circus and and sort of being acknowledged by the crowd and and boston's sort of uh appreciating seeing dick grayson get a little bit of a spotlight now there is an illusion in in boston brand's monologue that he and Dick have met before. So, and that did not happen on screen. Correct. However, they did have a couple of meetings uh, on, in the tie-in, in the previous tie-in comics, one being in Batman and Robin Adventures, where it's actually a pre-Dead, where Dead Man is just a, a persona that Boston Brand plays. Uh, and then a second one where they actually kind of do the the proper dead man origin where he's assassinated on stage uh, during his during his performance and, and becomes this ghostly character. Uh, so we're not sure if that's a direct allusion to either of those yet. Um, the fact that it, it's hard to say exactly. It doesn't maybe seem like he and Batman know each other personally. So it could be at least at the Gotham Adventures uh, adventure didn't didn't happen in this in this version of events but perhaps that initial one which i believe was written by ty templeton uh could <laughs> could have happened yeah yeah as you mentioned so that's uh batman and robin adventures number 15 is the one that was written by mr templeton who of course is the artist uh, for this one. And also, uh, he happened to also write the follow-up story in Batman Gotham Adventures number six, uh, which was the the following series title. Well, there, I guess technically there was the Lost Years in between, but was the, the tie-in comic to the new Batman Adventures, uh, the, the former being the tie-in to the Adventures of Batman and Robin uh, rebranding of Batman the Animated Series. But yeah, so this seems to be uh, either uh, a, a nice sort of uh, a wink and nod to Mr. Templeton and, and a, a tribute to his work uh, at prior Batman tie-in comics, or maybe uh, maybe he has been working. You know, we don't know what the uh, what the extent of the artist working with uh, Paul Dini and uh, Alan Burnett, who are the the writers for this. But uh, yeah, I thought that was very interesting that they alluded to that. And then later on in a conversation, uh, when we get uh, the reintroduction of Zatanna, another one of the stars of our month of magic, uh, Bruce Wayne is, uh, is actually talking to her after a performance, hoping to get some information from her because of some uh, strange interactions uh, that Batman has had and, and, uh, needing to, to talk to Boston brand. Um, he mentions that uh, Nightwing and him actually solved the murder of Boston brand, which also occurred in that other comic. So very interesting that they're sort of alluding to some of those other tie-ins possibly uh, as being canon, at least to this comic. We talk a lot mm -hmm. about things being canon as DCAU fans and whether or not these comics, especially these seasons of the adventures continue are, but it's nice to see them sort of semi acknowledge that if, that's what you choose to be head canon. Yeah, yeah, I, and again, we we talked about it quite a bit last time. Like I don't think I don't think this being a direct directly canon to every single moment from all, you know, hundreds of hours of DCAU programming or plus other tie-in comics needs to uh needs needs to be. Like I think it's it, we can judge it as is it a good story or a bad story and 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 that kind of stuff. But yeah, it is cool to see those little illusions. And whether or not they choose to directly reference those other tie-in books, or if they maybe they'll tell a new version of, of that story of Boston Brand and Dick Grayson uh, meeting earlier in life. Either way, uh, I think it'll be it'll be fun to uh, to see all of those characters along with Batman uh, in, interact together uh, in the course of uh, at least the second issue. 
Yeah, agreed. Uh, so moving on in the in the story, then uh, we kind of get the aftermath of the Mayor Hill murder, uh, his wife in in tears, and we get the introduction of uh, Mayor, uh, well, Mayor Hill's oldest son. Uh, we have already met, if you remember, in the episode Be a Clown of Batman the Animated Series, we had met uh, Mayor Hill's uh, m- child afflicted with male pattern baldness at the age of seven mm-hmm. or whatever he was jordan uh but in this we meet uh junior uh, also uh we assume is uh, hamilton hill jr uh, i believe they actually call him that later yes. on but uh so he's introduced and uh he's he's there comforting his mother he actually mentions jordan by name and and pops up later on but uh their their conversation uh occurs in front of batman and commissioner gordon and uh as batman is there he uh happens to notice wouldn't you know it another shadowy figure watching him from the rooftop across the way uh similar vibes to uh what he sort of experienced in the season one of batman the adventures continue with uh with red hood seemingly following him around uh for the for the majority of those first several comics uh, but then uh, that that takes him over to uh, discuss with a, a uh, an, another old recurring character from Batman, the animated series, Veronica Vreeland. That's right. Not only do we get uh, Veronica Vreeland, but we also get get the believe it or not, this is a return, the return of her father, General Vreeland, who uh, previously appeared in the episode Harley's Holiday, where, uh, of course, Veronica is kidnapped by Harley Quinn and uh her father the, sends in the military to try to get to try to get uh, Veronica back from Harley. Um, it's a, it's a all time classic episode written by Paul Paul Dini. I think it's one of the seminal episodes of the whole series. We haven't covered it yet, but it's it's definitely one I think people remember. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to kind of tie that in that way, and they sort of establish this backstory where uh, where Veronica's father has this large collection of of owl uh, owl memorabilia and batman notes that the the claw marks at and mayor hill's house at the crime scene match the claws in in this strange artifact in in general vreeland's collection and he sort of gives us our history lesson where for the uninitiated if you're not familiar with the court of owls the idea is basically there they're the gotham illuminati right they're they're right. the secret society that has of you know politicians and 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 perhaps police and and people that just have puppet mastered every event of any significance that has happened in Gotham City, uh, going back to like the you know the 1600s basically as as long as Gotham City has been a town, this court of owls has sort of silently from the shadows been controlling everything behind the scenes, and uh, and that we get a good amount of flashback there and and kind of an argument between between Veronica and her father as, uh, as, as there's mentioned that one of the artifacts was apparently stolen, which was a, a book. And there's a, uh, there's, there's some, uh, and that is actually when we get our first time seeing the talent in action as he shows up at the Vreeland house to, uh, to try to attack seemingly Veronica and, uh, and her father. Yeah. And uh, dead man actually sort of intercepts him on the outside uh, he's sort of observ- observing, and of course, Dead Man being a ghost is not able to be seen most of the time. But wouldn't you know it? We get a little bit of insight uh, that maybe this Talon fella is uh, is uh, he has some he has some extraordinary powers, I would say, because mm-hmm. uh, he interacts with and sees Dead Man, uh, takes a swipe at him, attempts to uh, attempts to Dead Man attempts to sort of uh, phase into him, which is what one of his powers is, and sort of. Uh, uh, haunt him or you know take on his essence I suppose possess him possess yeah that's that's the word I was looking for and uh, (laughs) he's unable to do so so sort of rejected uh, and dead man's a little bit confused by it Uh, this leads to uh, an attack as you said Talon was there to attack uh, General Vreeland uh boston brand aka dead man possesses veronica for a bit which is a fun little fight scene that takes place as she wields a sword uh batman (laughs) batman returns uh to the scene and uh, has his first interaction with talon um and uh and excuse me uh and at that point uh he he is able to get away by by sort of hurling a a weakened 
Veronica into the pool. Uh, Batman is distracted, saves her, and uh, Talon gets away. So uh, we then get another brief, brief scuffle between Dead Man and Talon as he sort of tries the same tactic, but this time to sneak up on him. And uh, it, it appears we're not sure. Uh, Talon says he's not able to kill him because he's a ghost, but uh, he says that he can uh, assure that his obstructing of the uh, the court of Al's justice will end in agony, uh, even even if he is already a dead man. So uh, some interesting interactions there. We do then get uh, a little snapshot featuring Jordan uh, on the screen, <laughs> uh, Jordan Hill, and he's questioning who would kill uh, the mayor. Uh, there's also speculation as to who's going to be the new mayor. And uh, we find out that uh, Hamilton Hill Jr. is the attorney general, or I'm sorry, not the attorney general. The, he's an attorney, uh, just like his father was before him. And, uh, and th- there's clamoring for him to uh, finish out his father's term, which is interesting. I, I don't know how politics work in Gotham, but he, they just hand over the mayoral uh, candidacy at that point because he's his direct son with the same name. <laughs> I guess so. I mean, I, I think there was like a, a U.S. senator in like our lifetime that died and was replaced by his wife. So oh, yeah. that does happen. I mean, he, they have to be appointed. But yeah, like that that sort of thing does does happen. But yeah, it's interesting to see that. And I think that comes to as we get to near the end of this first issue here, uh, what maybe the, the speculation begins as to maybe... Uh, is is this Hamilton Hill Jr., this character that is new for this book uh, and is seemingly the one with a lot to gain by his father being out of the way as far as furthering his own perhaps political aspirations? Is he, in fact, the Talon? Is he working with the Court of Owls? Is he one of the Court of Owls? Or is he just another pawn? There's a lot of uh, speculation that I think begins once once the they have a uh, summer Gleason deliver that that little bit of exposition about how he may in fact be the next mayor of Gotham City. Yeah, I think that that's that's going to be the most thing. We didn't talk about it from the get go, but this first issue does have a lot packed into it. It's doing a lot to set up uh, what obviously is going to come in subsequent uh, issues, but. Uh, there is a lot that's set here, maybe a couple of red herrings. Uh, I know that you and I talked about uh, sort of off air speculating. Uh, a lot of times it, f- it feels like if you set up such a giant neon sign pointing at, OK, here's a brand new character that's been introduced. He has to be a red herring. So in this case, maybe Hamilton Hill Jr. is the red herring. But and maybe there's another character later on that we've yet to meet uh, that will be introduced. But you had an interesting thought as to uh, possibly who could be involved, at least maybe not Talon himself, but maybe pulling the strings as a member of the court. Yeah, 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 yeah. My uh, my my general thoughts were that since. Uh, the obvious thing, I think it's possible because they established that General Vreeland is like this court of owls historian and that, you know, his father and his father's father was were obsessed with this court and were, were tracking it and trying to figure out their sort of secret code language and, and all this that perhaps Mr. Vreeland himself is, is, uh, is involved and, and this and the, the beating that he takes here could could have been staged because as it's established the talon is very powerful and very vicious and manages to fight off batman and a dead man possessed veronica vreeland um he does get eventually overwhelmed but it's it's a it's a pretty even fight with batman so you imagine that if he and veronica kind of comes into the room with him already knocked down so you imagine that if he wanted that man dead he'd be dead Right. Yeah, that does seem a little fishy. I guess the other the only other person that you could speculate, perhaps the mayor's wife uh, could be somewhat involved, uh, you know, and maybe she's working in cahoots with Hamilton Hill Jr. uh, that they wanted her father, you know, their father her husband his father out of the way uh for some sort of power grab or maybe she she was tired of being married to or whatever they could it could be any of these new new characters that they've introduced i think uh, mr Reeland definitely could be involved as well and uh, i wouldn't put it past them to maybe maybe involve veronica also because she has 
uh, she has such a, a prominent place in this first issue here. And it's uh, she also uh, had a, a piece back in season one. So it would be interesting to see if they, they flesh out her character at all, though turning her into a straight villain as opposed to just a, a, uh, a socialite might, might be uh, a little too dark, but we'll, we'll see. Yeah, it would definitely be a twist on that. We don't know much about her. She was another character who appears somewhat uh, in, in the new Batman adventures, but definitely not as often. Uh, we do know that her daughter is, is the, is the girl that is kidnapped in the Batman beyond pilot. When we see, Bruce Wayne's final night, but we don't really know much about the the latter half half of her life. So, yeah, they could they could do a lot. But yes, yeah, as we move on here, we see Nightwing and and Bruce uh, finally some yeah. Nightwing. <laughs> yes, Nightwing in costume, and he's sort of on watch at uh, at the hospital to make sure that the talent doesn't come back to take another shot at uh, at Mister Vreeland. And while while Bruce is having a conversation, he seemingly blacks out. And realizes when he does come sort of come to that he's holding a pencil and that he has written a note to himself seemingly saying he's a zombie and uh yeah <laughs> and that's and that sort of uh puts him on the path to realizing that something supernatural is happening and uh and he in fact takes a, a quick flight to las vegas to meet up with his old pal zana there you go uh john smith himself i guess at some point uh, has revealed himself to be Bruce uh, because she does call him by his first name. Uh, But uh, yeah, we, we, she gives a little bit of the backstory of dead man just for some filler. And then uh, Bruce uh, expresses that he's already aware of who he is and he needs to get in contact with him. So she gives him this, uh, this talisman type uh, piece of, like hardware that he wears, she calls it an amulet, uh, but he places it on his head uh, in a very, I love, uh, we'll talk about it in art, but a very, uh, he, he's very Zen in the moment. He's, he's sitting there and he's, uh, he's, he's cross-legged doing his yoga and trying to make contact with dead man and is able to in that final panel uh, where it looks like now he's a- using this this uh, this device, he's going to be able to talk to and see Dead Man. So uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I would. I hope that he has to wear the amulet on his head for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the series. <laughs> One can only hope. One can only hope. But uh, yeah, that's that's kind of a fun little bit. As we mentioned, there's another allusion there to perhaps that Gotham Adventures issue as. Is, as uh, Batman or Bruce mentions to Zatanna that Batman and Nightwing uh, captured Boston Brand's killer. So, yeah, that, that that's sort of the end of our first issue here. We're left with a lot of questions, not a lot of answers yet. We know, obviously, that there will be direct follow up in issue two. Um, I guess that's maybe another 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 way to basically uh, to baselessly speculate is uh, we know this is going at least another seven issues this time. Uh, do we think the Court of Owls is going to be the villain the whole season? Are they the big bad of this series or will there, is it possible in the latter half, we're going to maybe reintroduce Jason Todd and Deathstroke or, or, or maybe we'll just do some more one-off adventures. The, the solicit for issue three recently came out. We know the Huntress is going to be appearing along with the jazz man making his return. So there's a lot, uh, a lot of, seemingly a lot of characters being brought in and i do wonder if uh, uh if this court of owls thing is going to extend behind uh beyond the second issue yeah i i hope i certainly hope so i know that they they sort of uh jammed a whole lot and that was my i think one of our one of our critiques of that first season was that there was just so much jam packed into it and so many different characters. And we talked about it then that some of the, some of the reason why they did that was because that they had this, this was only started because of the interest in the launch of this action figure line from DC direct, which as you mentioned at the top of the show, no longer exists. So they don't really have the constraints to have to use Mm -hmm a toy line to sort of write around that in order to, to be able to promote those figures or sell more toys. Uh, So I I hope that they don't feel that they have to jam pack all of these different characters and they're able to sort of tell 
uh, more long drawn out, slow burn stories as opposed to, all right, uh, Court of Owls is over in three issues. All right. And now we got to bring in, but also in those three issues, we have Huntress and we also have, oh yeah. And the jazz man. And look, look over here, look at this person. Oh, and then we're going to jam <laughs> this other guy in there. Uh, it, to me, I think if we, if we know that this is going to go a full eight issues or so, uh, I think that a four and four wouldn't be, wouldn't be awful. Uh, maybe, you know, set up at the tail end. If you want to sprinkle in some of the mystery and intrigue of setting up, you know, what the later issues are going to be sort of how they did with the Jason Todd storyline from season one, I would be okay with that as long as it doesn't detract from the main story. Uh, but I think giving the Court of Owls, as we talked about, being such a pivotal story and, uh, and, and people being hungry to kind of see what this looks like in this world uh, that we've, we've been watching mm -hmm. for now 30, almost 30 years, uh, I, I think that it would do it justice to give it some breathing room. Yeah, I would agree. And I think this is the type of character that needs... I mean, because it's not it's not just a villain, even in the way and I know Deathstroke is very popular and he's a big time, you know, a list villain in DC Comics, but he's one guy. And so I think giving him two issues was fine. Right. Um, but yeah, with something like Court of Owls that is supposed to be this far reaching society that controls everything, if if Batman can can wrap that up in about 40 pages worth of work, that's. Uh, that's that's not uh, that's not particularly uh, that's not maybe maybe not doing complete justice to that character. Uh, and yeah, we're as we said, we're this is all of course speculation. All we know for sure is that they will be featured in the second issue. I could potentially see the unmasking of this first Talon happening, and maybe we see the the court drift into the background for the next couple of issues, and then maybe come back with a vengeance for the the last few but yeah we'll we'll have to wait and see but it's definitely i think uh i i too i think would would like to see them kind of be even if they aren't the main focus of every single episode to uh, to kind of see them working behind the scenes and in the same way that we saw jason todd work throughout a lot of uh season one before he made his his first really full appearance as the red hood later on one of the things that I think uh, I appreciate most about uh, some of the other tie-in comics uh, for these for this DCAU uh, and and what they did well uh, was kind of establishing some of these threads and starting storylines and then uh, later on not paying them off right away. Obviously, when you have a, a monthly comic that doesn't necessarily have a a, a destination finish to it where you know that it's only going to be X amount of comics. Uh, you kind of have a little bit more freedom to, to push some of those storylines a little bit later. Uh, but when you, when you know that you have to wrap things up by a certain period of time with no guarantee of a second or a third season or something like that, then uh, to me, it makes it, it, you know, it makes it a little bit more difficult, but I, I agree with you. I think, maybe giving some more of this to to uh, issue number two uh there's something that happens in issue number two that leads them kind of off of the the path of this court of owls stuff and then like you said maybe the last three or four issues uh you know in, in involving them a little bit more more heavily and kind of focusing on batman versus whoever is revealed to be a part of this group but uh yeah uh, it, we this is all speculation for now and we will find out uh next month i suppose uh, what uh what indeed will take place with this so uh, Liam, I guess we can move on now uh, so that we're done with our speculation and our, our plot review here. And we can talk uh, about the other aspect of our appreciation for these comics. And that is the artwork, the beautiful artwork by, uh, of course, the aforementioned Ty Templeton, best friend of the show, uh, Monica Kubina on uh, Colors. And uh, letterer, uh, lettering was done by Josh Reed. Uh, I also believe that the, I'm fairly certain uh, that Randy Mayer was the person responsible for the title card, at least uh, for the initial digital version that was released for, uh, for Amazon. Yeah, that's right. And uh, as, you, as you mentioned, we have Ty Templeton doing the the pencils and inks and and of course best friend of the show monica cubino on colors there's a lot of fun stuff in here as we mentioned we have we have the talon 
uh, making his first uh, on-page DCAU appearance, of course, based off of the action figure, which itself was, of course, based on character designs by Ty Templeton back when this was just an action figure line. Um, it's, uh, it's, there's a lot of fun. We have the Talon, we have Dead Man, we have uh, Zatanna. Zatanna looks pretty much like her, her JLU version, the hairstyle and everything, the, and the costume. Um, it, it seems like they're, they're, it's, more, it's closer to that look than to her, her animated series look, which I guess makes sense because if, if she had appeared in the new Batman Adventures, they probably would have sharpened up that, that look anyway. So I, I think that's fine. And then, yeah, we have, we have Dead Man. And of course, the, even though he's only in, a, in costume for, uh, for one page, just lovely to see just lovely to see that black and blue suit and to see uh, to see dick grayson on my screen to see that lovely hair flowing in the would-be wind except that it's a comic <laughs> so it's not actually flowing but you know what i mean hashtag hair movement dare i say imagine uh, hair movement that's right uh yeah uh i think we we uh we highly praised the artwork just for both the familiarity of Mr. Templeton's work uh, for Monica's expert coloring. And it's interesting because um, if you guys don't, you guys should follow Monica Cabina on Instagram because uh, she's actually in between her uh, hours and hours of work that she's been doing. Uh, she's been doing little teases here and there for various different things, uh, different panels, sneak peeks here and there. And the colors that uh, on her work is actually much more vibrant than what we often see either in the print form or even the digital form. Uh, so it's interesting when she releases the, to tell the difference between those those things, uh, those little sneak peeks that she gives. And then uh, later on, what we end up seeing in the actual comic themselves is a little bit more dull. But regardless, I think that the colors are extremely vibrant. Uh, of course, we're going to give lots of praise for that. There's lots of pinks in the Zatanna scene, pinks and blues and purples. Mm -hmm. uh, the red sky of Gotham, of course, uh, stands out. Uh, I, I, everything looks just very, very smooth. I do like seeing dead man, uh, even though he has that sort of translucent transparency, uh, that, uh, that sort of dulls his colors a little bit. He still stands out on each page. And then, uh, I think with the new character of Talon, I think what stood out for me is, uh, even though he, his color palette is not that different from, from Batman himself, the it, I feel like because of the way that they went with the highlights uh, of his costume being just sort of a, a deeper gray, a darker gray, he almost is like this jet black, dark character that's even somehow darker than Batman, even though they're in the same scene together. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's this almost almost completely uh, without with the exception of like the eyes and some of those other minor things. Yeah, it's a it's a very striking. It, it's one of those ones I think. Maybe other than Deathstroke, this maybe is like the design that came from comics into the world where you're like, yeah, you don't really have to do very much. Right. And I don't and I don't mean to say that to disparage. Like it's like it's perfect. Like that design, the claws and, and everything on the suit uh, really, really, uh, I think, make a make just make for a great DCAU style. It's not too busy of a look but I think it translated into that DCU style very, very well. And I, I think, uh, I think uh, Mr. Templeton did a great job uh, of, of that. And, and the colors on top of that sort of, uh, again, like you said, sort of making him an even darker character, especially when, when they're, when he's outside in the night sky, it's, and, and him sort of him back, you know, back sort of backlit for about lack of a better term against the moon uh, and, and some of those other tricks that, the, that, that they use throughout that, uh, that, that, the uh, the issue I think are just really tremendous stuff and yeah that's definitely one of those characters it's like yeah that that character fits perfectly that one doesn't doesn't stand out as as not belonging in this uh, DCAU world at all yeah that one particular set of panels where it's a it's a close up shot sort of chest up uh, of Talon and he's completely in shadow except for his eyes and the the uh, bandolier across his chest. Uh, it, those are lit up and his eyes are not just like a straight one straight color. There's like a mix of colors of oranges and reds there. And then there's a, there's a fantastic shot of him jumping from one panel and he's sort of outside of the panel. I love when comics do that, where the scene sort of bleeds over into the next panel, but there is some space between those. 
Uh, I'm sure there's a more technical term for the setup for those those types of uh, pages that way, but I love that that little like quad panel at the bottom of that that page there. And uh, there's some great expressions too. Uh, Dead Man is very expressive. Mm -hmm. uh, I think his look is very similar, also uh, much more true to what we saw him in uh, in the Justice League Unlimited as well. Uh, face more sunken in, uh, chin a little bit longer. Uh, so on model for that stuff. Uh, Mayor Hill, as we mentioned, uh, certainly uh, you can tell right off the bat who that is. And uh, even Jordan, uh, although I think <laughs> think you said maybe he had been hitting the Rogaine a little bit. In, yeah, that's uh, too much. He has too much hair. Uh, <laughs> Jordan, Jordan in the animated series episode, uh, Be a Clown, had the hair of a 47 year old uh, uh, congressman <laughs> from from New Hampshire. He did not have that much hair. But uh, yeah, we'll just assume that he's been uh, he's kind of growing it out and kind of combing it over uh, to <laughs> Maybe to, he paints his bald spot. <laughs> yeah, could be, could be. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I was actually going to mention that uh, that very that very first page, we get that sort of dramatic close up as uh, as Mayor Hill closes the uh, the sliding glass door, and you just can make out in in the blacks and blues of the shadows, you see Talon's eyes in the reflection of the glass, and then we get kind of a nice close up of Mayor Hill as he turns around, just really you know really greatly expressive face which he looks like a man who's about to be murdered yeah. uh so i i yeah I, I think they do a good job of setting up sort of the terror that that he's feeling in that moment it's almost set up like a like you would see in a in a horror movie or a horror comic uh in this case so yeah i i think there's some really tremendous stuff i definitely think the talon the talon himself uh or itself as well as as well as dead man they they definitely stand out as as the big highlights of this first issue for me agreed and i think uh w one last note i i think that the scene actually the first uh sort of interaction between talon and dead man uh takes place uh with it's a it's not a red sky it's a darker black gray sky but the the moon is shining there's two panels right back to back one where dead man is right over uh, the Batmobile, and then one where he's sort of sneaking up behind Talon. And uh, Monica did this really cool trick where she it really looks like you're looking at a, a moon glow, kind of like with the clouds surrounding the moon. Uh, just beautiful. Like, I love it. Like, it, it looks totally, it yeah. fits directly. It looks realistic, but also fits right in with this uh, with this world that they're in. And uh, yeah, I think, I think the mix of colors too, and the backgrounds are, are great, great palette choices for, for each different scene and each different place uh, that we kind of move through from Haley circus to, to the very end where we're, we're at Zatanna to Batman being on the gargoyle at the end. Also a, a, another classic Batman uh, pose uh, with Kate flowing behind him, standing on the gargoyle at the background. But then you have the, that, that sort of juxtaposed against uh, this meditations uh, sitting stance where he's, you know, cross-legged and his, his fingers in the very uh, Zen pose uh, <laughs> fingers, uh, you know, three fingers open, two fingers closed uh, type of stance with this, uh, this amulet on his head. So I really, really liked that. Uh, you know, I think we're gonna, you're gonna probably get tired if you hear these, hear these bonus episodes. We we talk a lot about how great the artwork is, uh, so uh, it, it's probably not surprising if you've heard any of our other ones, uh, Liam, that we're kind of guffawing over how how great the art is. Yeah, and I and I think again, we 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 joke about it and talk about canon so much on this show, and 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 I get it, and I'm not knocking people who like that. That's if that matters to you, that's okay. Like I'm not, I'm not telling anyone they're wrong, but we kind of joke about it, but I, I do feel like by putting in some of those elements, uh, elements like in season one, using the justice league slash return of the Joker, Joker model mm -hmm. and, and, and Zatanna and dead man. And in this case, using those sort of JLU models for those characters, at least visually, it does feel like we've begun to train. Like this does feel like a, a transition period between the end of the new Batman adventures and, and justice league starting. And, and I know, uh, I know at, at least uh, Paul Dini and Alan Burnett have sort of talked about uh, this comic being a sort of fun. What if for them, like if, if Batman beyond didn't get greenlit and they were doing more Batman back in the day, what are maybe some of the stories they would have told? Obviously it would have ne wouldn't have necessarily been with these characters in the case of a, a court of Alice that didn't exist for another 
uh, you know, 15 or 20 years, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think it's fun to see while this may be in some ways a, a, what if, what if we made more Batman back in the day, uh, on the writing side, I feel like visually at the very, if, if nothing else for, for you, you know, the, the continuity, the continuity buffs out there. I think, I think visually this feels like a nice kind of easy transition where we're seeing the jail use a Tana or the JLU dead man and, and still sort of mixed in with some of these new Batman adventures character designs and they, they fit right in. So I think it feels pretty natural. And I, and I like that. Uh, I like that he, that uh, Ty Templeton went with those, those uh, character designs. Yeah, I agree. It, it, it is a nice little sort of, uh, I don't want to say throwing them, throwing those, those that do uh, focus so much on that, whether or not this is canon or not throwing them a bone a little bit but yeah it's nice it does make it feel uh like and these those characters those versions of those characters are the ones that we're probably most more familiar with because you know the the prior iterations have been now almost you know 30 years for for Zatanna and and dead man never appearing uh in the uh in the actual shows and only having those appearances in in prior tie-in comics so uh yeah it is it is nice to kind of uh, have those more familiar designs and uh you know you can use them to kind of make sense about where we are timeline wise if if that is your cup of tea so love that uh speaking of liam i guess we'll begin to wrap things up here it's interesting that you mentioned justice leagues but uh we are super excited also uh as we continue here uh, we'll be back next month with another bonus episode uh covering the next issue of batman the adventures continue but that's not all uh while we have uh, while we're here in the comic book universe the comic book dcau i guess uh, we might as well talk about it as well. We uh, we anticipate doing uh, additional reviews over the summer for the uh, recently announced uh, Justice League Infinity comic book, which we are super excited uh, that is being helmed by one Mr. James Tucker himself. Yeah, that's right. That's uh, we've uh, we sort of mentioned that I think in our main show, but yeah, we have James Tucker and J.M. DeMatteis uh, writing the book. Uh, along with uh, Ethan Beavers on art. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that looks very exciting. We've seen a few preview images of that book as well. Uh, so yeah, uh, going forward, I think we're going to try to keep them separate episodes. But if there happens to maybe be a week where they both come out at the same time, you might get one extra size bonus episode covering both. But yeah, definitely either way, you will definitely get our thoughts all summer long and into the fall as we cover both Batman The Adventures Continue Season 2 and Justice League Infinity Season 1. Very exciting stuff happening in the DCAU. Gotta love that uh, we're 30 years out from this uh, universe kicking off and still getting new content to this day. Some of the some of the great things about being a not only a DC Comics fan, but specifically a DCAU fan. Yeah, and, and you you hope that with a you know perhaps a, an entire new generation of, of fans being uh, being exposed to the DCAU with it uh, with everything uh, everything important being on uh, on HBO Max now that maybe maybe they'll also be able to, to turn to these comics at some point and uh, and uh, appreciate uh, some of the great work being done on, uh, on the page as well as on the screen. So yeah, definitely love to see and, and spend any any extra time we can in this uh, this DCAU world whenever we can. Absolutely. Looking forward to it, Liam, as it's going to be one heck of a summer and uh, fall of 2021 going through this with you. Cannot wait. But uh, until next time, I'm Cal. And I'm Liam. And we'll talk to you on the next episode of the DCAU. Bye-bye.